Hello everyone, I'm Chandana Singh Nirvan and I welcome you all to the stories of the Indian Diaspora series curated under TM Vice Review June 2021. It is my immense honor and privilege to introduce and bring into conversation our distinguished delegate, Professor Bashabi Fraser, who is also a recipient of the Commander of the Order of the British Empire Award, New Year Honors 2021. Bashabidi is an award-winning poet, children's writer, editor, translator, and academic. She is Professor Emerita of English and Creative Writing and Director, Scottish Centre of Technical Studies at Edinburgh Napier University, a Royal Literary Fund Fellow and an Honorary Fellow at the Centre for South Asian Studies at the University of Edinburgh. Bashabidi is the Chief Editor of the academic and creative peer-reviewed international e-journal Gitanjali and beyond. She has been declared Outstanding Woman of Scotland by Saltier Society in 2015. Her other awards include Kavi Salam from Poetry Paradigm and Voice of the Republic in India, the Word Masala Foundation Award for Excellence in Poetry, Special Felicitation as a Poet on International Women's Day by Public Relations Society of India, Rabindra Bharti Society Honor, Women Empowered Arts and Culture Award in 2010, and the AIO Prize for Literary Services in Scotland in 2009. She has received various Scottish Arts Council grants and a British Academy Research Grant for her book, Bengal Partition Stories, an enclosed chapter published in 2006, and her co-edited book, Rainbow World, Poems from Many Cultures, was the runner-up for Emma Best Book Award in 2003-04. Bashabi Di's work traverses continents in bridge building literary projects. She has authored and co edited 22 books, published several articles and chapters, both academic and creative, and as a poet, has been widely anthologized. Three of her books are in the press for publication in 2021. Bashabi Di is Honorary Vice President of the Association of Scottish Literary Studies and Executive Committee Member of Scottish Pen. Poetry Association of Scotland and Writers at Risk Committee Scotland, a director on the board of the Patrick Geddes Trust, a trustee of the Kolkata Scottish Heritage Trust, ambassador of the Federation of Writers Scotland. She is chief ideator of the Intercultural Poetry and Performance Library in Kolkata and is on the advisory board of the same. The VNA Museum in Dundee and the Indian Association of Scottish Studies as well. Bashabi Di is on the editorial board of several international peer-reviewed journals and has been an adjudicator for several national and international creative writing competitions. She lives and writes in Edinburgh. Her research interests cover post-colonial literature and theory, Tagore studies, migration and diaspora, transnationalism and transculturalism in the postmodern world, personal narratives and oral history, literary theory and creative practice. We welcome you, Bashavidi. Well, thank you, Chandana. I'm a bit overwhelmed. It was very a generous introduction, uh, but very embarrassing and long. <laughs> but Not thank you very much, indeed. Pleasure, Bashvidi, to have and, you. Uh, yes. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to TMYS Review, to Chandana, to Dr. Shora Banerjee, to Coral for inviting me. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joining us in this conversation is Dr. Saurabh Banerjee. He is an associate professor at a government-sponsored college affiliated to the University of Calcutta. He has almost two decades of teaching experience and a PhD on Australian literature. He is an education ambassador of the International Organization of Educators and Researchers in the Philippines and is also leading this project. I welcome you, sir. Thank you, Chandana. Thanks for this kind introduction. And a very warm welcome to you, Bashvidi. And huge congratulations on the CDE. Thank you. Uh, and we jump directly into the questions. Yes. Predictably, yes, my first question is related to the CDE. I have this notion that no matter how much we grow up, there is always a child inside us who wants to be appreciated and likes awards and rewards. In this connection uh, to the CVE being awarded to you, 
you were of course informed about it much earlier than the official declaration so i have two questions now a what was your reaction upon receiving this wonderful news and b how difficult was it to keep it to yourself till the official announcement sure of you that's both are very perceptive questions yes we all i have a grandson who loves his sweeties those are his re rewards and for a writer and academic awards are different uh, i i got an email when i was in uh, india i had gone to bring my father back and i received an email from the honors office uh, in in london telling me about it i had no idea what a cbe was i actually had to look it up on the internet and uh, my first reaction was have they made a mistake uh, so i was really overwhelmed and um, it was very difficult because i couldn't tell anyone uh, mm. my father my family my husband who was here my daughter who was still here in in the uk so i couldn't sleep basically i i found it difficult to to i was very nervous very anxious and you know uh, and my i think the an uh, the anxiety was uh, th the secrecy of it but also the fact that you know of all people i had received this award and i i was humbled and i i think i was in a daze for days d a z e d a y s okay yeah. so, <laughs> i think that was that was it um and uh, it was at the end of november and i finally got another letter saying i could make it public after midnight 30th december when the awards would be announced so i did tell my family but not my friends Uh, I think the nation came to know yeah. through, through through the newspapers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, days for days is actually an absolute expression. Yes. Who didn't be dazed at this wonderful news? Yes. Uh, so I'll continue in the same vein, and then uh, the, my next question would be: the citation of your CV uh, says, "I quote, services to education, culture, and Scottish integration." Unquote. Now, integration is a very important term. Uh, i say this because for the asians and blacks they were uh, and also are always discriminated against in countries dominated by white people and uh, that is mostly because uh, i feel that way that they are othered due to a lack of understanding of their culture and heritage so would you agree with this and would you please tell us what were the things that you did to achieve this integration that's a very good question shurab um thank you i think uh, when i came here uh, uh, as a um, uh, uh, as as the wife of neil fraser uh, i i've been to scotland before when i was doing part of my phd uh, but when i came here uh, i realized that there was a lot of racism uh, i faced it uh, in subtle ways uh, not always overt and i know that many of my uh, friends faced a lot of racism that's when i realized that what people need to know is their own connections to india because people had no idea how deeply indebted they were to india here in the uk and they didn't know that almost every scot every brit had some link to india uh, so uh th through the through the colonial period and thereafter so i think the shared history was something i wanted to share with uh, the scots and with britain at, uh, uh, in general uh, i started with uh, dance uh, dramas and teaching dancing indian classical dance uh, i was never a professional but it was kind of something i did alongside my academic and writing career so i uh, i i decided that this was the best way to take our culture to a wide audience we had packed halls wherever we performed uh, and also the second generation 
learned to take some pride in their own culture by learning Indian classical dance, uh, getting used to folk rhythms from India, and knowing how much they could be appreciated through the music uh, and uh, dance forms of India. So that was one thing I did. The other I, uh, which I did was uh, I, I introduced a lot of texts uh, which were post-colonial texts by uh, diasporic writers, by writers who were from India, but also uh, uh, Scottish writers who had links with India into my syllabus. Uh, and of course, I introduced Rabindranath Tagore, who is a great universal figure, uh, a, 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 uni a universal voice, but also a liberal humanist. I, so that was one way to show the greatness of uh, uh, of, a, of having an Indian legacy and being linked to India. And I, uh, the final thing that I did was, apart from uh, when, uh, having artists and, uh, uh, and uh, speakers who came, I, you know, whenever somebody wanted to come, I tried to help with setting up programs, gathering audiences. So Nandikar was here. Uh, for example, and uh, then um, uh, uh, we had uh, Monjusri Chaki's group here who, uh, after Monjusri Mashi had died, but they did a wonderful program. But I also established the Scottish Center of Tagore Studies, and that really helped. We, we actually uh, um, established a journal, a website. We had various events. Uh, we established a distinguished lecture series. We had uh, exhibitions and film festivals, uh, concerts that shared our culture with the rest of the world. And of course, my own writing. Uh, if you look at my books, they are mostly uh, about Scotland and India. Yeah, yeah thank you I very much. Yes. Yeah, you have, you have, you have answered it beautifully. It is actually portraying our culture to those people to show that we have a culture and we have shared things. That is how we become acceptable. That is how integration is done, not by domination or by force. Thank you. Uh, Sandana, take it over, please. Yes, thank you, sir. Hashibidi, your father was India's first Commonwealth scholar in the UK and your mother was a scholar, won a scholarship at the London School of Economics. So spending a part of your childhood in London must have made the place closer to your heart, uh, considering that uh, childhood memories are often the fondest of all. So one imagines that it is easier to know both the lifestyles. How did you strike a balance in your lifestyle choices and how transcending both cultures made an impact on, your, on you and your writings? Well, that's a many layered question, a, a very good one, Chandna. Um, uh, yes, my parents had come to the London School of Economics as researchers. And uh, so uh, I think I didn't have much of a choice there because I came as a child with them. Uh, and um, I, where, even when I came back to Britain as a, a part of my PhD program, it wasn't my choice initially because my supervisor said I had to I had to go and do literary stylistics in order to uh, uh, you know do justice to my thesis uh, and I, I chose Edinburgh because um, my parents former friend Julian Dakin who had died for whom I wrote poetry and uh, his uh, his widow was here so I felt quite at home here uh, I think what has happened is, uh, if 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 you are a child somewhere, uh, you uh, you unconsciously uh, adopt that country because that country uh, becomes uh, yours. Um, so when I went back, London stayed with me, or England stayed with me, and we can stretch it and say Britain. It never left me. Uh, I think my uh, the fact that I, like some of you, did English literature. Uh, as an honor subject uh, for my ME, uh, my PhD, uh, also shows a kind of seamless um, uh, transition from one country to another. Uh, so I carried uh, England with me 
when I was in India. But India, I think, has never left me. India can't leave me. Wherever I go, India is with me. So I have these two countries, and um, I find that they, it, it, I have this dual existence. I know I call it living between my two worlds, but I think um, I'm not a, a person who lives in the in the interstices of existence. I think I live fully in both. Uh, so while I'm in one, I will explain or think of the other, and uh, I will also defend the other. So in a way, I'm straddling both nations, and I, I hope that sort of answers your question, Chandana, the way I integrate my two countries within my work, within myself, within my consciousness. Yes, indeed, Bashavidi. Uh, my next question is uh, about your collection of poems, Letters to My Mother and Other Mothers. So because of your upbringing, you have had the experiences of living abroad and in India with your mother. And after her passing away, you wrote this collection of poems, which are seen as a dialogue continued between you and her. And naturally, mother-daughter relationship is an umbrella term for friends, shopping partners, confidants, debaters, critics, and many more. Also, a deep connection can be seen between your stay in Edinburgh and Calcutta in these letters. So how has a sense of nostalgia been helpful to you in bringing out these letters? Mm -hmm. um, nostalgia, uh, yes, and longing, I think and uh, a missing link, I would say, my mother no longer there. Uh, I could picture my mother here, uh, and I realized she was quite uh, a valiant woman to, to brave the London rain and cold, uh, and she wore a sari uh, most of the time, uh, and it wasn't easy. In those days, there was no central heating, and my mother did a lot of the housework and and completed her research. Uh, so I feel that uh, when she went back to India, she was, she carried on, she was quite a pioneer. Uh, she was uh, the first woman lecturer, the first woman reader, the first woman professor in our university. So there we are, she continued the tradition of, could I also say the East Bengali woman? Uh, because uh, after partition, a lot of women who were displaced by partition became the breadwinners of their families. My mother entered the marketplace like many women. And I think they created a space for women, women in the professional sphere, women in the public space, women competing with men for jobs and sustaining their families. That is what brings back the sense of nostalgia for what I lost when my mother left. Uh, she died too early. She was, as far as I was concerned, she was too young to die. She was 72. Now my father's 90. He says he's 92. We think he's 90. But, um, uh, you know, he's still with us, which is wonderful. Uh, but I think through my mother, I uh, participated in life uh, in a way that was... Uh, she was very, she was an esthete, she was a great cook, she was a great gardener, she was an artist uh, who painted, uh, she was a beautiful singer. I missed all that. I missed my mother and th that cu culturally, academically, aesthetically rich growing up uh, with my, uh, you know, mother by my side is something that I look back on with nostalgia. But nevertheless, I do feel people who love you, people you love, don't leave you. And that is what happened. For a few years after my mother died, I could not write about here. And then I had this dream where she came to me in my dream. And I got up and I wrote this poem. It was a gift poem, a poem that just unfolded without me writing it, someone else was writing it. And then it became easy. I wrote poem after poem to her and I pictured her 
here because after I married Neil and came here, my parents came every year to stay with us. Uh, and when they retired, they came for six months at a time. So it was wonderful. But that is why I could picture her here and there. And she actually was the magic web that seamlessly wove my two worlds together in the past and in the present. Thank you, Dee. You put it yeah, in very beautiful was, words. Yeah. It was lovely to hear you told, remember your mother in that way. And I'm half guessing the answer to my next question uh, from mm -hmm. this. So Chandana, may I carry on? Yes, yes, please, sir. Vashivati, uh, you are not only an acclaimed academic, but also a renowned poet, a trained dancer, Kathak, if I am not wrong, and an accomplished cook. So would you please tell us where you acquired these skills and how you have used them in Scotland to connect with the society? And also, how does it feel to have so many avatars fused into one? Um, I, again, I think that that's a too generous a description. I mean, the, the words acclaimed and renowned um, uh, are adjectives that are not really what I would describe myself as. But yes, I'm an academic. Uh, I enjoy writing poetry. Poetry is my first love. But I do acknowledge I'm a trained dancer. And I think I owe this to my mother. Uh, she, she always found a Guruji for me when we went back and uh, wherever I was. And I continued to learn dancing, um, cooking. Well, I think if you have a, a grandmother with, uh, with um, out of this world skills, and then a mother who is a, a very sophisticated cook, and then if you have aunties who cook e equally well, um, you develop a palate that then guides you. So I think that's what helped me with my cooking. Uh, I, uh, when do I write poetry? How do I fit it in? Well, as an academic, I, I, I find the whole day has been, um, you know, too short to do my academic work. So poetry is quite useful because you can squeeze it in. It, 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 you can uh, intersperse uh, your, uh, what should be your sleeping hours with poetry. So I write most of my poetry in the middle of the night. A lot, since I don't have enough hours in the day, I do a lot of my cooking before going to bed. And um, I, the dancing uh, has been a chapter in my life, which actually I have closed now because I couldn't cope. I couldn't do so much. But I still love dancing, so I watch dancing. Uh, I And my daughter carries on the dancing. I don't know if I've maintained a fine balance between all of them, but they have all enriched me and given me uh, a kind of um, fulfillment, uh, which makes life both exciting and worth living. You'll have to give me a moment. My battery is running low. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, you can carry on. I can speak now. Okay. Uh, so should we move on to the next question, Bashwini? Yes, please. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Uh, my uh, my next question will be a bit long. Please bear with me. You have talked about uh, India-UK relations, and you have talked about Tagore on this side. So one Scottish name that is very important uh, in terms of India-UK relations is Patrick Geddes. In fact, the two stalwarts of India of his time, Tagore and Swami Vivekananda, both of them lived in and around Kolkata, but they seem to have met only once in 1899. But Patrick Geddes, he had met both of them multiple times, and he had even corresponded with Sister Nivedita, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm not wrong, in 1903, by the time Swamiji was dead about setting up a Tata-sponsored university uh, according to the dreams of Swamiji. And he also corresponded with Tagore about setting up of what is today known as Vishwabharati University at Shantaniketan. 
and he was also the biographer of sir jagadish chandra bose mm -hmm. yet not too many people in india outside of academia know of patrick gedel you have worked on him and his correspondences with rabindranath tagore so uh, i'd like to ask you what is your take on this great man and how far his efforts have gone into building india uk relations mm well uh patrick gedel like rabindranath is one of my gurus so thank you for that question um patrick gedel is actually uh, uh, on invitation provided plans for between 50 to 80 cities of india so that is his huge contribution to india um he was a conservation architect and town planner so he didn't go and say that you know just bulldoze this part of the city because it's uh, deplorable uh, but he always found, found the positive side he used very little money and he uh, he did a little uh, uh, minor changes here and there but whatever he did uh, 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 actually uh, was with full respect for a country's tradition its culture and uh, its own architecture and plans and he saw it all as Uh, very much in the context rather than superimposing uh, uh, the western mode of architecture and living onto the indian scene so in that sense patrick gedes was um, a visionary uh, one who was deeply rooted in the local he was the one who uh, who's saying we now all adopt um, you know think local uh, act global sorry global. yes think local act global um, and that is it you know the local and the global we have this uh, absurd term locality which i don't uh, like but local and global are what make patrick gedes and rabindranath the visionaries the relevant uh, minds that we continue to need uh, another thing about uh, patrick gedes you mentioned sister nivedita and really glad you mentioned bibikanondo uh, their lives overlapped uh, and sister nivedita also knew uh, rabindranath as we, as you know uh, oh, what is pertinent to say is that uh, gedes also had uh, the, uh, the chair of uh, uh, civics and sociology in bombay uh, uh, and that was his first chair and then he had a chair in botany uh, in dundee so he sort of spent time uh, uh, in both places uh, he was 9 years in india uh, a very active 9 years and yes you are right sure uh, when uh, rabindranath was um, uh, was thinking and uh, and uh, working on uh, bishobharati an international university he invited uh, patrick gedes to provide the plans for bishobharati which tagore did I think the other link between them was Arthur Geddes, Patrick Geddes's son, uh, geographer son, whom actually my parents met at the London School of Economics and knew. And uh, uh, Arthur uh, spoke perfect Bengali, according to my parents. And uh, I met Arthur's widow, Jani, when I came to Edinburgh. Uh, and then I uh, and Murdo McDonald, who has written a, a, a very good article on the quartet. Uh, that's patrick gedes sister nivedita uh, uh, rabindranath mm, uh, uh, or rather the triangular and jagadish chandra bosh uh, a triangular and a quartet a relationship um, it was murdo who told me about the letters between gedes and tagore that were at the national library but he said that the other side of the correspondence was not there so that's when i uh, went on a uh, on a hunt a treasure hunt and i found it in uh, rabindra bhavan and that was it i just couldn't get away from these two men and i edited their letters i co-edited with omrit chen and uh, tapati mukherji uh, the confluence of minds where, which is uh, the letters be uh, between uh, sorry the uh, articles of tagore and gedes on education and the environment and actually my fourth a revised edition of a meeting of two minds the gedes tagore letters are in press and they will be out this summer 
So uh, as far as I can see, Geddes, like uh, Rabindranath, was a polymath. Uh, mm. He never thought of uh, Indians as subservient or substandard. Uh, he was very fond of his uh, Indian students. In fact, Anna Geddes, his, uh, his wife, uh, looked after them like a mother, um, you know. And uh, as you know, that uh, Geddes was very close to Abula and Sir Jagadish Chandra Bosch. And uh, he held Jagadish Chandra Bosch in huge, uh, uh, with huge regard when a lot of Western scientists wanted to dismiss him because he wasn't white. Yeah. And so your uh, your hunting for the letters and publishing them actually completed the bridge, which would otherwise have been, I mean, had would have remained incomplete for maybe many more years to come, if at all they were discovered and published. Uh, thanks yeah. for this wonderful answer. <laughs> yes, Didi, you are saying something. Well, I'm just saying I would I would still like to say that I owe a lot to Murder McDonald. Professor Murder McDonald, but I also would like to mention another name, Professor uh, Shapun Mojimdar, who has died, uh, uh, because Shapundar actually uh, really encouraged me, opened doors for me, and he he just gave me. Uh, he said, uh, "I will let you work on this on two conditions. One is uh, Bishop Bharati should publish the book, and secondly, it, uh, the letters should not just." include the letters between Geddes and Tagore, but uh, other luminaries within the circle. Now, how could I say no to either of those very constructive uh, instructions, you know? So I had, uh, the, the first edition was actually published by Edinburgh University, Edinburgh Reviews uh, book series, and the second edition by Vishwa Bharati. Okay. Thank you, thank you for your answer. Uh, Sandana? Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, Bashidi, talking of cultures and integration, your poem From Ganga to the Tay is an epic that elaborates upon the rich cultural history of both India and Scotland. Uh, why did you choose two prominent rivers as metaphors for transnationalism? Hmm. An excellent question. Um, well, rivers symbolize civilization, don't they? I mean, uh, early civilizations, all civilizations grew up along rivers. Uh, ports near the cities came much later, uh, but rivers carried the whole uh, idea of development, progress, humanity along their banks. They, and uh, we can't do without fresh water. They provide transport, they provide food, uh, they provide uh, sustenance uh, but the other uh, the other reason was rivers don't necessarily uh, stay confined within nations i mean the ganga starts uh, somewhere in the himalayas and it's debated how many sources she has probably three uh, and uh, s some of it uh, then all gathers together and some of it actually empties itself the river waters in another country now, which is Bangladesh. Uh, and so rivers are transnational. Now rivers uh, are, are, are the bodies from which trade began across the world. So even if you look at something like Thames, uh, you know, uh, all, the, all the goods that came up the Thames and down the Thames uh, and then reached the world or came from the world uh, made the river a transnational conduit. Uh, the Tay was the same. The Tay is the longest river, like the Ganga in, uh, in, in India. The Tay is the longest river in Scotland. And with its Dundee links, um, we can see that this was the port from which uh, the jute went out and other goods came in. So uh, rivers are transnational because they speak to the world. They link the world uh, to their nations. So I think that's a transnationalism. But other th the other reason is, uh, while rivers are uh, stand for uh, uh, communication and connectivity, it's people who come to their banks. 
So why, the, uh, we are here in Britain because the Scots, the Brits were there once. If they hadn't gone there, we wouldn't have come here. And we are here near the rivers. So the transnational rivers bring about transnational migration, whether it's of the colonizer from the colonizing country or the colonized coming back to the shores from which the colonizers began their journeys. So I think the rivers stand for life, for continuity, for connectivity, for com communication, and are global in intent. And if they had their consciousness, they would say that too. And they stand for peace. Uh, rivers are not there to destroy the world. Uh, yes, they cause havoc, but a lot of the havoc could have been prevented by us. So I think that should answer your question. Yes, yes, be very interesting. Yes, and like you said, rivers stand for life. So talking about life, the title uh, is about your first collection of poems. And it contains 59 poems and many about India and some about Scotland. To quote unquote, what makes a city is not its architecture, but the life within the city. The book offers a trip through Edinburgh. There are memories of the festival, of the city's bars, of the changeable weather, the flowers and the birds. Would you describe these kinds of poems that speak of the nitty gritties of a city as travel writings as well? Hmm. Why not? Because uh, I don't do travel writing as such, but my poems allow me to embody my travels in verse. So yes, and uh, the here and the there, the departures and arrivals, the resonances, uh, the changing seasons, uh, one season that reminds uh, me of another in another country, uh, but and of the differences. So, you know, while it drizzles here continuously, uh, it pours in India during the monsoons. So, uh, yes, I will miss my mangoes. And uh, but when I go there, I might miss my strawberries. So uh, there we are. Uh, can't have uh, both, but we can live with nostalgia. I think these are about journeys. Life itself is about a journey. Uh, the title poem, um, a lot of people have said that it's very like Gadi Nuzrul Islam's Bidruhi, the, uh, the revolutionary. Uh, I th it's interesting because I hadn't read uh, Bidruhi before I wrote it. Maybe I had heard it, I don't know. But it was quite amazing how many Bengalis have told me that. And Bidruhi is about life itself. And life takes us on various journeys, doesn't it? Both physical and mental, but also emotional uh, and metaphoric. So I think, yes, poetry and the poems in my first collection could be about the various journeys I've made. All right. Thank you, Vashvidi. Uh, over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Ashwini, you have not only been a strong advocate of UK-India relations, but you have actually worked on it, as uh, exemplified, amongst others, through your academic exchanges between Edinburgh, Napier University, Vishwabharati University, and Calcutta University, which resulted in two books. But perhaps uh, one of the other fruits of this desire to be connected to your homeland is the anthology on Bengal partition. Bengal partition stories, an unclosed chapter, which comprises of real life accounts of the people who witnessed the partition. The nation partition affects at two levels primarily. One, the feeling of being uprooted and dislocated. And the second is the straining of inter-religion dynamics. In this context, what according to you uh, can be the factors uh, that determine the concept of homeland? Is just being born in a place sufficient to call it homeland? Or is it the feeling of belonging 
and feeling welcomed in a country that creates uh, the concept of a home what would you say that's a very nuanced question um home home uh home should come with a feeling of security shouldn't it home should be something that should make you uh, feel that there is a sense of permanence here uh, home should also uh, be in ensconcing embracing uh, and uh, uh, a place where you feel uh, nurtured and valued um so um home is a it's not just about having a roof over your head walls around you uh and you could, it's not a house because i don't know how many times my houses have changed um so uh being born in a country well i'm a post midnight child i know i'm much older than you but believe it or not i'm not that old so i uh i was born in india uh, my parents and grandparents were born in what was east bengal the eastern part of bengal and in fact most of my family many of my friends families come from there they were born there their parents and grandparents and yet they had to leave so what became home the ho home was in india for them it was a temporary affair it was mostly rented it was crowded existence but it, and it was a a protracted uh, post partition struggle and uh, but it it's the country that gave them some sort of asylum uh, which i think is being uh, questioned again now uh, which i find really uh, disturbing and sad um when does a country become your own when does it feel like home i think a lot of it is when others accept you when they don't uh, uh, you know consider you the other uh, when they do stop calling you abusive terms i mean we have embraced the term bangal proudly but when it was first used it wasn't a compliment um to be called a paki doesn't mean you're not uh, uh, you know that you're a pakistani to be called a paki is to be denigrated pakistani for those who come from pakistan should be a compliment should be a recognition of their heritage so uh, that when it's how others perceive you how others welcome you how others uh, accept you is uh, our what make make you feel at home uh, for me in britain i must say that um i i feel very grateful because i've been published here uh, i have had uh, all my awards here i say with some embarrassment i've also uh, received the highest national honor this year which i very grateful hugely grateful for uh but also i i have my personal chair my academic position here but also i've been made an uh, a professor emerita here so all these uh welcoming accepting gestures have in a big way made me feel welcome and at home uh, but i must say whenever i go to india in a in a most indescribable way though i've been away for so many decades now that i immediately blend in i immediately feel at home so i think i have two homes but it's how people make you feel how people perceive you and how they welcome you and accept you is what makes you realize where you are most at home yeah uh, so it's it's so it's that you don't get to choose your home your home chooses you by assimilating you and you can have multiple homes at the same time absolutely yeah, so that is a very well well illustrated answer i'm so happy with that answer because i've learned so many things from it yes chandana please go on yeah thank you sir uh, bashabidi uh, 
how has the literature of diaspora and by the diaspora helped in easing the pain of the colonial past and bridging the huge gap between two nations here one being the colonizers and other being colonized mm -hmm. um once again that question is a complex one because while i can i have read the a lot of indian diasporic writers i have also read writers who are of the scottish diaspora in britain in, in india and uh, in 2017 alan riek and i we uh, co-edited thali katori uh, which is an anthology of scottish and south asian poetry of scots okay. who went to india and wrote about india and of south asians who came from the subcontinent here and wrote about scotland so here you have diaspora working both ways it it all depends on where you departed from and where you arrived uh, but it doesn't always uh, it isn't always a neat uh, divide between the colonizer and the colonized um, so that's what we have found a lot of scots uh, were very very sad when they had to leave india and uh, many of them died there and those who came back uh, never really fitted in uh, i'll give you one example and that is uh, sir daniel hamilton uh, he uh, was uh, uh, he he was the single most um, wealthy Uh, Scott in India at one point in time, he made so much money from the P&O shipping company uh, that he could have come back and become a Scottish nabob or nawab <laughs> uh, and lived a life of luxury. Instead, he asked the viceroy if he could buy nine thousand acres in the Shundurbans, uh, and that's what he did. And then he gave away that land to the people, and he said they could come and settle there. uh on on a, a couple of conditions that they would have to leave all their differences behind of um religion caste uh language creed region behind they would have to live as one community and the other was that they would have to uh take as much land as they liked but which they could maintain and there we are we have this man building cooperatives there he's written a lot about that mostly in letters and uh, and uh, speeches and little essays and uh, there's a wonderful book called the philosopher's stone uh, brought out by um, to to bengalis an anthropologist and a civil servant so do look out for it about sir daniel hamilton so i think here you have Uh, uh, a diasporic scot who actually was very very close to rabindranath and uh, and more or less embraced uh, india as his home and tried to uh, alleviate the poverty uh, of a lot of people through his cooperatives through microcredit which is uh, was the first man to establish and rabindranath actually was a friend of his who also had done corp started the cooperative movement on his own so i think Uh, diaspora is something that um has helped me when i look at how people miss their uh, countries uh, but also see uh, humanity wherever they are in the people they're surrounded by as they see resonances of customs of rituals of habits and of literature which portrays humanity everywhere as being very very similar so i think that is what has sustained me um that i belong to a huge tribe of writers who have left one country arrived at another carrying that country with them but seeing some sort of um association that is very close to what they knew in their own country yeah absolutely
All right. Thank you. Thank you, Vashvidi. Over to you, sir. Yeah, uh, this will be my last question. My last question for the day. And again, it is uh, a pretty obvious question. Since we are talking about India-UK relations, we cannot but talk of Brexit. So how, in your view, has the Brexit affected the Indian diaspora in the UK, if it ha has? I'm pretty sure it has, but uh, what is your take on that? Well, I mean, um, I voted against Brexit. And if there was, if there is another vote, I'll vote against it again. So uh, in Scotland, 60% of Scotland voted against Brexit. Uh, having um, not directly witnessed partition, because I came after that, but having witnessed the pangs of partition amongst those who uh, witnessed it, uh, fragmentation of nations is something that I'm always wary about, worried about. Mm. Uh, Britain is a small island. We are already or, or already quite isolated, surrounded by the sea. Uh, we are an extension of Europe, and uh, I don't see, uh, you know, the many benefits. I, I don't see the benefits of this separation. What will it do to Indians? Well. I mean, uh, a lot of Indian businesses are tied to uh, uh, markets in Europe. Uh, a lot of uh, um, academics uh, would like to work with European funding and uh, European institutions. Uh, that will be difficult. A lot of uh, Indian artists, along with their British counterparts, uh, uh, well, kind of, uh, mainstream counterparts, let's say, uh, have found uh, name and fame and recognition in, uh, through their European tours. They'll find that very difficult now. So I think Brexit is going to really affect us in many ways, but uh, different ways. But it also means that we won't have Europeans come to work here uh, in the jobs that Brits never took up. Uh, you know, it's no use saying mm. they come and take our jobs because they don't, <laughs> because they don't want to do mm. those jobs. Those who are here, others have to be brought in. Every country has benefited from migrant labor. So will they come mm. from India? I don't think so. But even if they don't come from India or Pakistan or Bangladesh, uh, we will be seen as um, the ones who take away jobs from the mainstream. And that won't have a good effect on us. It has been a largely uh, uh, isolationist vote, and the isolationist uh, consciousness will always pick out those who are easy to spot as the other. And attacks have happened, and they will continue. We are safer in Scotland, and being middle class and, you know, in, in kind of positions that are considered powerful, we might think we are safe, but we should never think that because we should think of all our compatriots who need our help, who need our support. So we should reach out and we should be aware of what we have brought on ourselves. And I think we'll be poorer for it for at least five decades to come. Okay, so that is indeed a very bleak picture that you have painted. Chandana, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, this would be Bashavidi, my last question. Uh, it's on your e-journal, Gitanjali and Beyond. It explores the connections Rabindranath Tagore established and the impact he had around the world. We see a similar trajectory in your writings, which brings people, cultures, communities, and nations together. Which aspect of Tagore's life and writing has impacted and influenced your writings? Well, thank you. But first of all, I, I am nowhere near to go. There's no comparison. You know, uh, if he's, he's re reached the zenith, I still stand on this earth. So, you know, we are miles apart, poles apart, but he is an inspiration. What has affected me? I think his intellectual integrity, uh, uh, his, his cultural abundance, uh, and his liber liberal humanism, 
his old whole idea of interdisciplinarity in education, uh, his uh, knowledge of the environment and uh, its uh, and uh, its sustainability as uh, paramount in our lives, uh, his uh, total uh, rejection of divisions in community. Uh, he saw humanity as a whole. He didn't believe in the dominant or the subservient. He felt every region, every people had something to offer to the world. Uh, his deep respect for humanity is something that I think is, is, is what I find most um, inspiring and meaningful. Uh, and of course, uh, his songs will stay with me. So when I'm really uh, sad or happy, uh, you used the word nostalgia earlier, nostalgic. If I need any song for any mood, any emotion, any occasion, I can go to Tagore. If I want a line that corroborates what I want, what I believe in, what I think, if I want to counter an argument that is divisive or narrow, uh, I can find it in Tagore. So I think Tagore is it is kind of someone who one day we will realize that what he has written, what he has done in a lifetime is unimaginable. Even if we could do a fraction of what he did, we would be continuing his work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bashvidi. That was uh, indeed a very beautiful answer. Um, I think uh, we'll have to wind up this conversation, though we do not want to. We can, I think, go on listening for hours. And uh, this whole journey of you joining us as a delegate until now, it has been such a learning experience for all of us. Thank you so much, Bashvidi. Thank you, Chandana. Thank you, Shorab. And thank you, TMYS Review. Thank you, Vashivadi. It was an honor talking to you.